Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Talking Tudors. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. Thank you so much for joining me today. Before we dive into this week's episode, I'd like to mention once again a weekend with Elizabeth I, a two-day online event exploring the life and reign of this iconic Tudor queen that's taking place on the weekend of the 17th and 18th of February. Enjoy talks by seven leading Tudor history experts, all from the comfort of your home. Participants will have access to all content for two months after the event ends, so there's plenty of time to catch up if you're unable to watch any of the lectures over the weekend. The stellar cast of contributors includes Dr. Nicola Tallis, Professor Suzanne Doran, Dr. James Taff, Professor Carol Levin, Professor Maria Haywood, and Dr. Owen Emerson. To learn more and to register your place, head to my website on thetutortrail.com or just Google a weekend with Elizabeth I event bright. I really do hope you'll consider joining me. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the generous listeners who continue to support Talking Tudors on Patreon and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, I invite you to join the Talking Tudors Patreon community. Visit patreon.com slash talkingtudors for more information. Join the Talking Tudors patron family to instantly unlock access to exclusive posts, including audio releases and videos. Patrons are also eligible to attend additional monthly live talks and take part in a member-only book club, and also enter patron-only monthly giveaways to name but a few of the perks. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks, and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Teresa Brock to the show to talk about Marguerite de Navarre. Theresa Brock is Assistant Professor of French Studies at Smith College. Her research interrogates identity and hermeneutics in the early modern era, drawing out parallels between the early modern and the modern. Her first book, The Visionary Queen, Justice, Reform and the Labyrinth in Marguerite de Navarre, appeared in October 2023 with the University of Delaware Press. Her second book project explores how factors of identity, such as gender, sexuality, social class, disability and more, influenced interpretations of nature during the Scientific Revolution and the Protestant Reformation, and how these interpretations enter into dialogue with our own perspectives and climate change. Let's dive straight into our conversation. Welcome to Talking Tudors, Teresa. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Yes, I've been looking forward to this conversation. So I suppose a good place to start is you just introducing yourself to our listeners and just telling us a little bit about you and your background. Sure. Well, I'm currently an assistant professor of French studies at Smith College, which is in the United States. I am an early modernist. Um, So in the French context, that means everything from the 16th century through the revolution But in my research, um, I do focus on the 16th century primarily. And in addition to the history and the literature um, of the time, I'm also very interested in different facets of identity. So for instance, gender, religion, sexuality, etc., and many others as well. And how these different factors of identity shape how texts by writers of the time represent the world. And when I say the world, um, I mean two things. I mean, first, human institutions, and then second, also the natural world. So in my first book, which is The Visionary Queen, on the topic of uh, Marguerite de Navarre, 
I am looking at specifically the church and the aristocracy and how Marguerite's experiences of gender and social class and religion, and then also sexuality, inform depictions of those institutions and their corruption in her writings, and most notably in the Eptemiron. So that is, of course, her most well-known work. It's a collection of short stories and debates. And it's a collection that points to this pervasive problem of systemic abuse and violence against women. And actually, sexual violence is a really prominent um, motif in that work. So what I'm looking to show in this book is that when we see Marguerite's contributions in her literary writings and also as a diplomat and as a religious reformer, we should really be giving her her full due by calling her a visionary, somebody who is forward-looking, who has a vision for justice, a search for truth, someone who wants to see society bettered. And so I think that that's really the, the crux of what I'm looking to do in this book is to show Marguerite the visionary and also see what points of overlap there are with women's justice issues today. Wonderful. It sounds like you're doing some fascinating work. And we are here, of course, to talk about this wonderful new book that you've mentioned and about Marguerite as well. So what is it that actually drew you to, to Marguerite? Well, I first encountered Marguerite de Navarre during my graduate studies at um, Penn State, and that is where I did both my master's and my doctorate. And actually, you know, studying for the master's exam, there was a required reading list. And that was the first time I encountered the Eptemeron by Marguerite de Navarre. And it was sort of a pivotal moment because I knew that I wanted to focus on this era. But I didn't know what specific century or a corpus of authors. And as soon as I was reading these stories, I knew that this was the world I wanted to engage with. And I think You've said something similar to that, where you have described your fascination early on with the Tudor world and the Tudor court. And I think for me, it was similar, but through the medium of literature, because the court of Francis I obviously is not exactly the same as the Tudor court, but there are some important similarities, the intrigue, the arts, the intellectual engagement, and also the female influence and power. So I think what happened was, as I jumped from one story to the next, I saw this rich tapestry emerge of Marguerite's society. There were tales about working people, about the wealthy and powerful, corrupt rulers and clergymen, tales about systemic abuse against women and also women who fought back against it, tales about infidelity, revenge, trickery, unrequited love, religious contemplation. And so I think what struck me was just how ideologically complex this text was, and what that must say about both the writer and the time period. And that's when I really wanted to delve into Marguerite's own life story more and learn more about her as a historical figure and not only as an author. And so I was really intrigued to learn about her central role in religious reform in France and also the ways that she was respected as a religious reformer, but also as a diplomat by uh, ambassadors from all over Europe and also um, from England. And we'll, I'm, cer I'm certain, talk about that um, as this conversation unfolds. But I think that, you know, historians have summed it up well when they say that Marguerite was in many ways queen in all but name. I know recently um, you had an episode about Queen Claude, Francis's wife, and she was a very influential and important person. But I think that um, something that Marguerite brought to the fore was that she was able to stand in when Claude couldn't be there. So whether that was due to pregnancies or illness, and because Marguerite was such a sparkling personality, so gracious and well-spoken, she was able to have great influence in many arenas of 16th century life. And so I think that the fact that we're still talking about her and still debating the meaning of her works so many hundreds of years after is very impressive and really underscores the visionary nature of her life. It is indeed extremely impressive. And I and I love that these are the women that, of course, influenced Anne Boleyn, which is the woman that I spend a lot of time studying and researching. And it makes a lot of sense when you look at Anne's queenship and then you look at the women who, you know, who she wanted to emulate, really. So um, let's talk a little bit about Marguerite's family and early life. There may be some listeners who perhaps aren't very familiar with her. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So Marguerite's mother was Louise de Savoie, um, and she was heavily involved in her daughter's education. And actually, Louise's personal motto was um, books and children. So that tells you something about the seriousness that she brought to educating her two children. And this was a multifaceted education. So Louise was, of course, instilling a love of literature 
in her daughter and also in Francis, the future king of France. But she was also um, very shrewd and politically astute. And she also made clear to Marguerite from early on that there were certain strategies that a woman needed to adopt in order to exercise power. And this is something that she, Louise, had learned herself um, as a young woman at the court of Anne de Beaujeu, who was also um, a very influential woman herself and had written treatises on the education of young women at court and, and how to handle different situations. So Marguerite was taking mental notes, we could perhaps say, watching her mother and learning how to appear deferential in order to in order to obtain certain outcomes. But in terms of literal content, Marguerite's education included biblical history and Latin. One of her tutors was François de Rochefort, for instance. So this is a, a very well-known individual. And we should note as well that Marguerite received the same education as her brother, even though this was a country with Salic law enforced. So Marguerite would not be able to reign and to be the monarch. Nevertheless, her mother made sure that she got this equal education. And her parents, Louise de Savoie and Charles d'Angoulême, were both avid readers, both patrons of the arts, and they had a wonderful library, um, which was a resource for both of the children. So there were texts on a number of topics, um, the Carole des Femmes, or the woman question, so an early modern debate about um, the role and nature of women, but also religious treatises, texts by authors like Petrarch and Aristotle and Dante, Christine de Pizan, for instance, a wonderful proto-feminist writer, and many others. And I think the last thing I would say about Marguerite's formative years is she really learned the value of relationships. So one motif I think that we can see is that Marguerite often chose to operate relationally in order to wield power by building up networks, many times networks with a large percentage of men. And this was something she learned early on. She, her mother and brother were referred to as the Trinity because they were so close and operated in tandem in order to secure Francis's position. Um, and so I think that's something that's that stuck with her her entire life. In your book's introduction, you, you state that, and I, I quote, Marguerite lived in a moment of religious and institutional turmoil that witnessed also significant developments in the arts. So could you tell us a little bit about some of this turmoil that you're talking about and also the changes taking place during Marguerite's lifetime? Yes, well, this is a, a really interesting question for so many reasons. The first being that Marguerite was born in 1492. And of course, this is a year that is well known for other reasons. Um, so from her earliest moments, the world around Marguerite was changing in profound ways. We had early phases of colonization by European powers in the Americas, along with um, the very destructive contact with Native peoples that was occurring during this time. And all of this sort of um, brought to the fore a lot of anxiety and uncertainty um, in Europe around questions of identity, questions of geography, of biblical history, the question of who are these peoples, you know, can we align them with certain descriptions in the Bible or not, post-flood, for instance. And so that brought a lot of um, unresolved questions with it. And then the second area of ideological upheaval is, of course, the Reformation. So in 1517, with Martin Luther's 95 Theses, we have the beginning of a very long period of ideological unrest. And I think that nowadays, it doesn't seem shocking to us to think that, of course, there can be a diversity of religious views and practices. But we have to remember that prior to this event, there really was one way to be a Christian. And one needed to be very cautious because diverging too much from that one model could have really dire consequences up to and including death. And so I think it's important for us to remember that in the 21st century and to give this moment its full weight for the people who were living through it. And then I think the last thing I would say is that in addition to colonization and religious reform, Marguerite was living through cultural change as well. So you know, Francis, her brother, was the Renaissance king. His court was a very refined place, and it was a very Italian-influenced place. Francis was fascinated by Italy for so many reasons. There were territories there that he wanted to reclaim, that he viewed as rightfully his. But um, he was also very interested in Italian court culture, art, and literature. And so we shouldn't be surprised to see that influence on Marguerite's own writings, and it might be interesting to note as well, just briefly, that Leonardo da Vinci was actually invited to come and live and work in residence 
at Francis's court at the end of his life, and he did accept. So this just reinforces um, how much Italian influence there was. Yes, I, I was lucky enough to see where he stayed, actually, near Francis's palace in France. It was amazing to be in the same room thinking that that's where he created some of those those masterpieces, really incredible. Now, Teresa, it goes without saying that Marguerite, of course, lived in a deeply, deeply patriarchal society. And you've talked about some of those lessons that she may have observed and learned from her her mother. But how did she manage to work around those limitations imposed on her in order to openly exercise power? That's such an important question. And um, in this regard, she certainly was her mother's daughter. In in other regards, she was less so, especially in terms of her, her religious beliefs. But Marguerite definitely internalized from Louise that women had to appear to adhere to the gender norms that were prescribed for them um, by their society, and that failure to do so would actually impede them from exercising power. And that can be sort of confusing in some ways to us today, because for instance, women were expected to appear chaste, they were not expected to be verbally assertive or openly rebellious. And so the sort of power that Marguerite and her female contemporaries wielded was essentially subversive in nature, and it had to be that. And so in order to appear unthreatening, as I sort of alluded to earlier, Marguerite very often operated through relationships. And she did this both in religion and in politics. One particular relationship of note is um, that between Marguerite de Navarre and her spiritual advisor, who is Guillaume Brissonnet, and he was actually the Bishop of Mao. And so Marguerite and Guillaume Brissonnet were both heavily involved in spearheading the evangelical movement. And that was a movement that was seeking to reform the church from within without breaking from the Catholic church. And so what was interesting was Marguerite sort of partnered with Guillaume Brissonnet and a number of his um, male allies uh, within the evangelical cause. And because she did this, um, she was able to become known throughout Europe as the central figure in this evangelical network. But she managed to do it very discreetly and managed to do it relationally. And then also in the domain of politics, we know that Marguerite was a diplomat. She was actually entrusted with an, a mission so important as going to negotiate the terms of her brother, the king's release from captivity, when he was being held captive by his arch nemesis, Charles V. And so she was very politically involved. And one scholar who analyzes this in depth is actually Barbara Stevenson, who wrote a book on Marguerite's power and patronage, looking in depth at her correspondence. And what we can glean from that correspondence is that Marguerite was interested in playing the roles of both a patron and a broker. So whenever it was in her power to obtain a favor, for instance, for a client, someone who was seeking her protection or her intervention, she would do so. And if it was a favor that somebody else was really better suited to offer, then she would function as a broker and sort of an intermediary for her client in that case. And then I think we should say, of course, as well, just to hammer home um, how well known she was, figures as um, famous as Erasmus and John Calvin were in correspondence with her. Um, John Calvin, of course, had a rocky relationship with her because Calvin, of course, would go on to break with the Catholic Church and was very eager to criticize Marguerite for not doing likewise. Um, he actually called her a Nicodemite at one point, meaning that she was like Nicodemus from the Bible who would only speak with Jesus at night so as to avoid criticism. But that was not really a fair critique. And um, essentially what it what it shows um, is just the extent to which she was well known and respected and appreciated and the elaborate networks that she built up to exercise power. And so can you tell us a little bit more about Marguerite's religious beliefs? What is it that she was actually looking to do or wanted? You've talked about obviously reforming the church um, and just a bit more about her role as this kind of active promoter of religious reform. I think it's so fascinating. Yes, of course. Well, as I said, Marguerite was the central figure in the evangelical movement. And I think something that's so important for us to think about is that when we hear the term evangelical today, it, it probably for many of us has very specific political connotations that we need to evacuate from our minds when we're talking about the 16th century, because it meant something totally different, of course, at that time. And to call someone an evangelical was essentially to say that that person was what we might call a moderate reformer. This was somebody who did not want to break with the Catholic Church, but rather wanted to purify the church from within, cleaning up corruption, and then also 
making sacred texts available in the vernacular and providing as well opportunities for religious education um, in the vernacular. So we certainly see um, what we might call today some Protestant influence um, on this group, and that was significant for sure, but they were not openly opposed to the church in the sense of breaking with it. And I think it's important um, to note that it was a really tricky position that Marguerite was in. Her spiritual advisor, Guillaume Brissonnet, was very much desiring for her to intervene um, on behalf of the evangelicals and to do so aggressively at, church, at uh, court. And Marguerite did do so, but she kind of had her work cut out for her because on the one hand, Louise de Savoie had always been religiously more conservative than her daughter. Actually, there's an interesting episode where Francis is abroad at war and Louise is regent, and she actually cracks down on the evangelicals um, and persecutes them in his absence because her own spiritual advisors have convinced her that the reason Francis isn't winning his Italian wars is that God is angry about the evangelicals. So Marguerite didn't necessarily have staunch support, even from the other two members of her so-called trinity. Francis was certainly more su supportive early on, but would become less so as time went on, um, in part because of the Affaire des Placards, or the Affair of the Placards, which was this scandalous event in 1534, where anti-Catholic posters were hung up in several French cities and also, most significantly, on the king's bedchamber door. So as you can imagine, he did not take very kindly to this. He interpreted, he interpreted it as a threat to his security, also a threat to his authority. And he would become much less tolerant and friendly towards the evangelicals after that. But Marguerite never gave up um, trying to push for the evangelical agenda. For instance, she invited um, famous evangelical preachers to court one example is Michel Darande, whom she invited to court in 1523 and 1524. And then also there were those who were working on trying to translate works by Luther, for instance. An example of this is Louis de Berquin. And he was actually caught in possession of Luther's works and was getting himself into trouble. And Marguerite had to intervene to help him, which is something she did very frequently when her friends, the reformers, were getting into trouble. And I guess the last thing I would say is that we also see this commitment to religious reform in Marguerite's writings. Um, her very controversial text, The Miroir de l'Empecheresse, first appeared in 1531, again in 1533, and she herself got into significant trouble with the theology faculty at the Sorbonne because the text had very strong evangelical influence. The second edition included sacred texts in the vernacular, so Clément Marot's French translation of the Psalms. And actually, in that instance, her brother, the king, had to intervene for her. So she did her best to walk a fine line. She had to, but she certainly didn't hesitate to stand up for what she believed in. Yeah, so incredibly admirable. I find that that courage and that faith. So let's talk a little bit about the role of women, specifically women in the reform movement. I know if people that have been, you know, sort of studying this period would be familiar with quite a lot of women involved in the reform movement in the 16th century. So do we know what Marguerite's beliefs were specifically around women engaging in these sort of religious activities? Well, I think that one thing that's very important to consider when it comes to Marguerite de Navarre as both a reformer and a woman is that in her circumstances, she could not have written an overt treatise expressing her ideas on either of these topics, either reform or women. Um, that first text from 1531 that was um, certainly marked as especially controversial in its second edition had taught her that she needed to be very careful to pursue her objectives without causing undue problems for her brother. And that was a very difficult situation because she was this courageous woman. She was this justice-oriented, active individual. But at the same time, she needed as part of the royal household to support her brother and to present an image of cohesion within the royal family. And so when Francis intervened to save her from the Sorbonne theology faculty, he made it very clear to her that she needed to be a bit more discreet moving forward in what she said in her writings. Now, what all of this means is just that what we glean about Marguerite's views on women and their role in the reform movement has to be gleaned somewhat indirectly, both by what she did and what she wrote in her literary production. And I think that's something that um, the visionary queen is seeking to do 
to show that across Marguerite's corpus of texts, we see women who are depicted not only as targets of abuse, very often by the clergy, but also as agents of positive change. There are a number of texts in which we see women spearheading positive change by calling out abuses directly. The Eptemeron is a wonderful example of that because there are both tales and debates and an equal number of men and women as the characters who are debating. The women are very forceful in their opinions. And also we see female characters across Marguerite's corpus. Her niece Charlotte um, in the Dialogue en Forme de Vision Nocturne after Charlotte's death is talking with Marguerite um, from the beyond and giving very wise spiritual advice. So again, we have a female who is um, offering religious instruction. We see this as well in Marguerite's plays. There's one play called um, La Comédie du Monde de Marzon that is from later in her life, where the topic of church reform is essentially parsed with I individual characters who are all women. So each one is sort of an allegory for a different viewpoint on church reform. And so I think that in her writings, we really see this sort of moderate approach where she's being maximally effective, but drawing as little ire as possible for her activities. Now, amid her many political and religious activities, Marguerite, of course, found time for, for reading. I would absolutely love to hear about her impressive library at Narak and some of the writers and works that inspired her own thinking on literature. Yes, well, her library at Nerac was impressive for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, she had very extensive holdings, and these were from a number of different literary traditions, from Arthurian legend, from the Italian context, for instance. And one notable example of that, of course, is Boccaccio's Decameron, which is also a collection of short stories. And Marguerite does name this text as a major source of inspiration for her own uh, most famous work. But scholars have shown, and I also argue um, in The Visionary Queen, that we have to be careful about hasty comparisons there because there are also a number of really significant um, divergences between Boccaccio's text and Marguerite's. And this is on a number of levels, including with themes such as gender roles and systemic abuse against women, also the equality of men and women in terms of number in Eptemeron's text. There are five of each. The addition of debates that are very spirited, which are not present in the same way in Boccaccio's text. And so what I think is that what we see in the Eptemeron is essentially Marguerite de Navarre yet again wielding power subversively by calling on a male ally, in this case an indirect male ally, someone who represents erudition, and someone who can provide a certain mantle of protection indirectly so that she can go about um, her aims. And so she is very strategic in that regard. But that um, anecdote aside, coming back to the holdings, the other things that we see in her library include works from the Carole des Femmes. So for instance, the very famous uh, Roman de la Rose or Romance of the Rose, which has of course been criticized fairly extensively for its misogynistic depiction of women and their sexuality. But then perhaps more encouragingly in a more proto-feminist or early modern feminist vein, Marguerite also had works by Christine de Pizan, who was this very, of course, influential um, French writer who wrote the book of the City of Ladies, which is essentially an effort to build up this edifice of influential, virtuous women across history. And so this is a response to a lot of the misogynistic arguments that were being written at the time. And I think I should mention as well, in addition to these holdings, that Marguerite was in contact with so many influential writers of her day. She protected and supported people like Clément Marot, also François Rabelais, Bonaventure Despariers, Étienne Doré. So these were big name people um, who benefited from Marguerite's protection and with whom she was regularly exchanging ideas. And so she had a rich community in terms of literary endeavor as well. And of course, you've already mentioned uh, many of Marguerite's works and the fact that she was quite a prolific writer. So do you want to tell us maybe a little bit more about what you think she hoped to achieve through these particular works? Yes, absolutely. Well, I think scholars have read her corpus in so many ways, and rightly so. They are very complex ideologically, but I read her as a visionary, and I think that there are very compelling reasons to do so. I think that she was someone who was forward-thinking and inspired in numerous areas of her life and society. 
for someone to have had the influence she had, not only as a writer, but also as a politician, also as a religious reformer, is quite extraordinary, especially for a woman in this time. And so what I see in Marguerite's works, um, several of which, of course, we've already discussed, is the contrast between the world as it is and the world as it could be. And by that, I certainly do not mean um, that Marguerite de Navarre was in any way naive or utopian. I think she was the exact opposite of those things. I think she was very realistic. And I don't think she could have been anything other than realistic, given the environment that she grew up in and then lived in for much of her life. But Marguerite de Navarre was a profoundly Christian person. And so she believed in concepts like the fallen world, original sin, um, redemption in Christ. So she had this sort of dual set of meanings that informed the way she saw the world, both sin and redemption. And so I think that when we look across her corpus of texts, we see both of these things at work. We see sites of sin, sites of corruption, but we also see efforts to make positive change happen, not in a perfectionist or idealized way, but in a very practical way, that if things can't be perfect, they can certainly be better. And I think that was certainly the mentality that Marguerite de Navarre brought to her writings, which did function as a channel for her own perspectives on the world. And I think that um, just a couple of texts that I haven't mentioned yet, since we have mentioned so many, although even at that, to be quite honest with you, we have barely scratched the surface. She, she wrote so extensively. But another of her texts, for instance, Les Prisons, is um, a wonderful example of this because we have essentially an analysis of the various prisons in which human beings can find themselves as they're seeking meaning in the world. And so for Marguerite, these prisons can be anything from romantic love, um, you know, an obsession with physical reality in the natural world, losing oneself in study. All of these things for Marguerite are essentially false trails. They're prisons. And so for her, the way out of the prison is through faith. And then again, we see earthly realities versus spiritual ideals in the Eptemeron. At first blush, that text could appear um, very earthy indeed in its subject matter, and some people have interpreted it that way. But in recent years, scholars have come back around, and I agree with them, to the fact that this is an evangelical text. And I think what this means is that Marguerite is always looking for ways to reconcile what is with what could be. And so just because we see representations of corruption, that doesn't mean that there isn't a process of working through or envisioning something better. And in fact, I think that visionary impulse is what ultimately predominates in so much of what Marguerite wrote. And just to begin wrapping up our conversation, what influence do you think Marguerite had on other 16th century women? We've already mentioned a couple that that, that may have been influenced by her. Yes, well, I think um, this is a moment that I was excited for in our conversation, because now is the time we get to talk about the Tudor court, right? I'm talking <laughs> yes, Tudors. Exactly. <laughs> So um, you mentioned Anne Boleyn at the beginning of our conversation, and Anne had, of course, lived in France for quite some time. She had been sent to France for Mary Tudor's sake, because Mary Tudor had, of course, married Louis XII, who was Francis's predecessor at the French court. And, um, you know, historians have written about Francis's interest in Mary Tudor. He did find her very interesting. Um, and he attempted to court her after Louis XII's death. It didn't go anywhere, of course. They did not marry. But all of this is just to, to demonstrate how closely intertwined all of these individuals were. We don't necessarily talk very much about Marguerite de Navarre when talking about the Tudor court, but we, we very well could because all of these people do, did know each other quite well. And then Anne, of course, as well, remained in France for a time to serve as a lady-in-waiting to Queen Claude, who was Francis's wife. Well, all of this is to say that um, there was great proximity between these people, and Anne in particular would certainly have been observing Marguerite's activities re religiously, politically, and also in terms of her literary work. And that is one reason why um, some scholars believe that Marguerite may have actually sent a copy of her miroir de l'Empecheresse to Anne, and that this could be one possible explanation for how Elizabeth may have had this text in her possession to then translate it later on. That's a possibility, for instance, that Su Susan Snyder raises, among others, such that, for instance, perhaps, um, you know, Catherine Parr might have been reading the book already and have recommended it to Elizabeth, given the reformist sentiment of the work and Marguerite's reputation across Europe as a reformer. But in any case, however Elizabeth came across it, her rendering of Marguerite's text is very intriguing. And one of the reasons for this is there are several key moments of gender ambiguity, I would call it, in how she translates the original French. 
So for instance, there are moments where in the original French text, the word used is father. And then in Elizabeth's translation, the word gets changed to mother. There's also an anecdote where Marguerite, um, she's using many familial analogies in that text, Le Miroir, to show the sinful soul's relationship to God. That's sort of the point of the work. And there's one point where she compares God to a merciful husband who forgives an adulterous wife. And in the way Elizabeth translates it, she frames it that the husband is the one who is deserving of punishment and not the wife. And so Anne Prescott has, has written some really interesting analyses of all of those um, tendencies, but they're very, very interesting to consider given Elizabeth's relationship to her father and to everything that she witnessed with his father's many wives. I think also... Um, Jumping ahead a little bit, we can say that um, Marguerite had an extensive influence um, across history as well. I'm thinking of her daughter, Jeanne d'Albret, who would go on to become a leading Protestant figure in France when the evangelical movement did not succeed fully in its aims. And then from Jeanne d'Albret, we would have um, Henri IV, who was Jeanne d'Albret's son, and he would become king of France. And actually, Elizabeth wrote to him to offer him advice about how to handle the religious uprisings and turmoil between Catholics and Protestants in France at that time. So all of these women um, were involved with each other in a large um, transnational network that extended across time. So finally, Teresa, can you sum up for us Marguerite's visionary qualities? Of course, this is what we've been discussing and what we might learn today and take away from her work today and apply in our own lives and work. Yes, of course. And I think um, one thing that I do in the book that I think is important is to think about how we employ terms today and how terms were employed in the 16th century. There's actually quite a bit of overlap between what we call a vision, for instance, today and how the term was used in the 16th century, including in French. So for instance, if we go to Merriam-Webster, Merriam-Webster has many different types of definitions of vision and visionary. There are some connotations for the word vision that are, for instance, literal, the faculty of sight, others that are more intellectual or creative, for instance, having an artistic vision. And then, of course, there is a spiritual vision. So, for instance, having a vision of a mystical nature is, is another connotation of that word. And all three of those um, sorts of, of definitions are also present in Marguerite's time in early modern French dictionaries. So that's interesting to note. I think today, when we see the word visionary, we have many connotations. One is someone who has foresight. And I think Marguerite de Navarre certainly had foresight. She was someone, for instance, who knew in a very shrewd way that she needed to pursue her objectives carefully and strategically. And this is actually what contributed to so many of her successes. And she knew and understood as well that if she pursued her objectives too aggressively or in an unthoughtful way, that violence could result. And of course, we did see that ultimately in France after her lifetime with the French Wars of Religion, when the conflict came to a head between Protestants and Catholics, and it became one of the bloodiest eras in French history. So Marguerite definitely had insight and foresight. And in addition to that, I think one of the ways in which she is a visionary um, actually sort of contrasts with one connotation that we see in Merriam-Webster the term visionary can sometimes be associated with a certain idealism. As I think we've discussed in this conversation, Marguerite was not idealistic at all. But she was optimistic in the sense that she believed that positive change was possible. And I think that that spirit, that realistic optimism, is something that undergirds a lot of social justice movements today. And that's actually what I talk about in the last chapter in the conclusion. Because that last chapter is essentially saying, how do we respond to Marguerite the Visionary? Um, what ways can Marguerite inspire us today? And I think that what her life and her work show us is that women working independently or in networks can make lasting change in their spheres of influence. And I think that we have seen so many examples in the past 20 years or so of social justice movements led by women that have had profound impacts, movements against racism, against sexual violence and harassment. I've, I've often said in, in talks that Marguerite de Navarre's Etemeron can be called an early modern Me Too, because it's just story after story of women essentially saying Me Too through this text when women were not actually allowed to say Me Too because they had to hide sexual violence committed against them, unfortunately. You know, in addition to that, we've seen movements for girls' education worldwide. 
so many examples. And I think that that's something that we can really take away. This notion of Marguerite, the visionary, whose legacy extends across time and who invites these parallels with social justice movements that are led by women today. You've given us lots of food for thought. I feel just inspired listening to you talk about such an inspirational woman. So thank you so much. There is one last question that I have for you, and that is our Tudor takeaway. So this is, or it could be a 16th century takeaway. So something for our listeners to go off and explore after the episode. Sometimes people recommend books, films, songs, all sorts of things. So do you have a takeaway for us? Yes, I do. So I want to recommend... Since I first became engrossed with Marguerite de Navarre through looking at her Eptameron, I want to recommend a free English translation of the Eptameron. So if listeners are interested, they can search the University of Pennsylvania's digital library with the keyword Eptameron or Heptameron, and um, the link will come up. It's one of the first results on Google. And if you're interested, I could also send you the link directly if you wanted to include it um, on your website. But if... Listeners want to click on that link. There are 72 tales plus a prologue, so it can sound like a lot, but the tales are bite-sized. They're very short, highly engaging and enjoyable. It's a text that's very easy to pick up and put down over time. And so I would just encourage people to explore that, to get to know the world of Marguerite de Navarre. If they're interested in the Tudor court, I have no doubt that they'll find really striking parallels and reasons to come back to the study of French culture at this time as well. So that's my Tudor or 16th century takeaway. And I, I guarantee it will be a memorable read. Oh, thank you so much. And yes, I th the link would be wonderful. And I can add that to our show notes just to make it nice and easy for everyone to find it. That sounds really fantastic. And I encourage everyone who's listening, I'm sure they want to learn more and, and dive deeper into what we've been discussing. So please do check out The Visionary Queen by Teresa, Teresa Brock. Wonderful. And this conversation has been so interesting. I thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to come and talk to us about this incredible woman. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners. So if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family. And don't forget to subscribe, rate and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind-the-scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. <music> <laughs>